Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for tuning in again for another edition of The Fact Is. And I'm your host, Hollis Grant. Now, this week, we are going to be reading a an article that was put out on the CBC radio. CBC happens to be uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is a state owned and operated news agency that operates a website, has television and radio programs, um, national news. It was a concept that was thought up in the 70s as a way to uh, unify the nation, uh, Canada being the largest country on the planet. Uh, has its difficulties when you have 37 million people spread out throughout the population or size greater than uh, Russia. So at the time it was created so all people from all across Canada had a common place to gather to watch the news, which was in, in theory a, a very interesting idea. However, that's since changed and manifested over the years. Uh, it receives currently uh, $1.5 billion in uh, public funds uh, to maintain. It has a listenership uh, that is one of the lowest in the viewership. It's less than 3% of the population watch the news. The why is that? Uh, it could be that the uh, articles aren't in touch with Canadian values, what people want to listen or want to, to hear. But there's an article that was really fascinating that I did find, and I did want to share it with you today. Uh, before we talk and go on about the CBC and um, state-run media, I would like to point out that um, there's other countries that did have state-controlled media. Some state-controlled media, Venezuela, the former Soviet Union, the former communist Romania, the former communist Poland, the former communist East Germany, all had state-run media. All of which are also listed in the 2020 Press Freedom Index under a very serious or difficult situation when it comes to press freedom. Some of the interesting theories behind state media, also China is a great one that does have a wonderful state media. They promote the regime in a favorable light, vilify opposition to the government by launching smear campaigns, giving skewed coverage to opposition views, and also act as a mouthpiece to advocate the regime regime's ideology. Have a listen, have a look at any newscast that airs anytime and see all those four points being used when they don't criticize the Trudeau government. The Trudeau government, Justin Trudeau, had his, uh, at the time, a leaked image of him in blackface uh, right around the time of the federal election. The story did break. It did not break on Canadian media. It was not broke by Canadian sources. It was done by Time magazine. Time magazine was the one that broke the story about Justin Trudeau wearing blackface. And as such, to other incidences, so that would be three in total, of documented proof of him in blackface and brownface, I guess we could say, as he did portray a Al uh, Aladdin uh, at an Arabian Nights event. And he also did grope a reporter, none of which was initially covered by Canadian media. But let's go on to see what this really fascinating article is today. Because uh, it is something that I did want to share with you. The article is called, Ronaldo Walcott Calls for the Abolition of Property, posted March 5th, 2021. Ronaldo Walcott says that he learned early on that, quote, property was a problem for black people. 
As a child growing up in Barbados, he and other young boys would sometimes take a stock of sugar cane from a plantation, and the watchman would call the police on them. Quote, that has stayed with me all these years because it really demonstrated the way in which property organizes social relations, the way in which property is used to keep people in particular boxes, the way in which property is not just about something that's material, but it's also about a set of ideas, end quote, Walcott said. He sees a disturbing echo between the fact that young boys young black boys in Barbados were punished for stealing a small piece of sugar cane and the fact that their ancestors were brought to that island as property themselves. Quote, the people who I am a descendant of were taken to that small island, Barbados, to work on sugar cane plantations, they were not only producing resources for others, but they themselves were a resource. They were property of others, end quote, he said. The history of that continues to shape black life, I would argue, even today. That childhood experience also taught him that property was often accompanied by a threat of violence, a belief that strengthened after George, George Floyd was killed by the police for allegedly passing a counterfeit $20 bill. To transgress someone else's property brings with it this kind of tremendous form of violence, this tremendous form of pro prohibition, in that prohibition can be such that you lose your life for it, he said. In his latest book on property, Walcott argues that private property is a driving force behind problems of inequality and police violence in contemporary society and comes to a provocative conclusion. If we take seriously that the history of black people having once been property is a part of the fundamental problem of our societal arguments today, if we take seriously that the theft of indigenous resources and the movement off of their own land is a part of the problem of our social relations today, then at the heart of fixing that problem is going to have to be the reckoning with property. I think that there's only one way then to address that problem, which is abolition. Walcott argues instead of for a society based around communal forms of ownership. Under this idea, we would say that someone can't own their house, but housing would not be something that becomes an investment. Housing would not be the thing that becomes someone's retirement package. Housing would be something that is understood as a foundational to how people can live, he said. So the question then becomes not so much individual ownership of the things that we love and cherish, but rather a communal conversation about how we can expand all those things to people currently without them. The abolition of property has been tried before in communist countries, and were accompanied with tremendous violence. Walcott acknowledges those failures, but argues there is a way that we can think about the failures of communist countries that doesn't really have anything to do with the, ab ab the abolition of property so much as that those forms of communism failed because they were not able to abolish elite cultures and el elite legislative power in terms of shaping what the society looks like. He argues we should look instead to other societies through, through history that have more successfully practiced forms of communal living and ownership, including some indigenous communities. When you look to other societies that have practiced forms of communal living that have been somewhat successful, if even interrupted by colonialization and transatlantic slavery, often that you find is that those societies don't have necessarily elite structures. While many indigenous legal orders involve some form of communal ownership, Val Napoleon, the Law Foundation Chair of Indigenous Justice and Governance at the University of Victoria, says indigenous law contains a wide range of approaches to property. Some of the ways that we have organized ourselves are similar or have similar attributes to what is considered private property today, she said. 
So I'm very reluctant to go and just say private property is the problem. Indigenous people owned land through different structures. For the Gitskin people, lands were owned by kinship groups and other things in the world were owned as well, such as oral histories. So there's a whole complex way of understanding property that has to be broadened. Napoleon argues for a wider understanding of what property can be rather than its abolition. What I wouldn't want to see is another conversation that wipes out indigenous peoples. Ways of relating to the world and the things in the world that happens through many discourses where people have decided, for instance, that law is a problem and it's law that's oppressive then want to wipe that out from their imagination of what matters in the world, she said. In doing so, they also wipe out Indigenous law. Christopher Essert, an associate professor of law at the University of Toronto, says he believes that we have today a distorted, defective version of what a system of property could be. But he believes it's possible for property to become an egalitarian institution. I agree with Ronaldo's thought that we should be thinking about housing not as a kind of preserve of the 1%, as a kind of financial instrument, but rather as a right that everybody should have. But I want to say that, that a right to housing would not or would be a kind of property right, he said. I do think that the idea that when I own a piece of property, when I own a house, it allows me to kind of participate as an equal with all my neighbors in all kinds of different activities, inviting them over and having a sort of community event that are predicated on each of us having a kind of part of the world that we have a little bit of authority over. What we need is a system that ensures that each and every one of us can have some form of that protection, Essert says. So there you have it. You have three different quote-unquote experts, all of which are talking about taking your property away from you. The right to own a home, to own property, or to have property should be thought, should be discussed. This should be a discussion that is worth having on state media, on state radio, on state publications. So when the CBC is talking about, and funding from the government, is talking about taking or having a conversation about having everybody have housing, taking away ownership. It's communism, plain and simple. The Canadian broadcasting company, or communist broadcasting company, I guess it should be. Now, yes, people should have homes. I think homes are, are great, and there is a big problem with supply and demand and housing. But that happens. It happens throughout the world. When the population explodes, people need to live somewhere. And the bigger plot of land that you have, it goes up for sale and supply and demand. It's the basics of basis of consumerism. And there's nothing wrong with a retirement home or living in a home for 20, 30 years. A home is the largest investment that one will make in their entire lifetime. And there's nothing wrong with it if you've lived in a small community of 15,000 and you've seen it over your lifetime of 40, 40, 50 years go up to half a million people or even a million people. There's nothing wrong with owning that land that you purchased 50 years ago, and also including for inflation, well, there's nothing wrong with ca capitalizing on that success. But should people be taking, or should government be talking about taking away land? Should we be looking towards indigenous communities living in Canada? Should people be looking at the indigenous people for guidance? The same indigenous people that did not have the wheel. The same indigenous people that did not have written laws. That did not have a written language. That did not have horses. The idea of the majestic 
Native American sitting on top of a horse, surveying the lands of the desert with his bow and arrow. It was the Europeans that brought over the horses, and they just ended up becoming well, the riders of horses as the horses expanded and did very well on the plains. But is it fair to say that we should be looking towards in Native Americans, Indians? Indians also practice slavery. And if we're going to bring up the fact of slavery, then who are we going to talk about? If we're going to say that because of slavery, America is successful, I understand that they're talking about Canada, but we are going to use America as the de facto slavery uh, topic. So, four estimated four million um, slaves in America at any given time, and with that, they created such a, a wealth, and these four million slaves um, went on to build America today. Well, if it was just pure slavery, then why is not Brazil a national or international powerhouse? Why are not they not the most dominant nation in the entire world when they had five million slaves? Five million slaves, smaller land mass, they should have um, a well-institutionalized country. They do not. When we look at the Civil War, why was it that the South lost? Because it couldn't keep up to the innovation of the North, the, in the innovation, the changes, the production of free people working together for a common goal. The South was slow to adapt, and as such, couldn't keep up in technology, technological advances, and lost the war. And America's better for it. And the South didn't really rise in terms of an economic powerhouse until the 1970s, when all the old Jim Crow laws were all repealed, and people could get out and start making money, and start working, and start contributing, and only being held back by their own ambitions. Then that's when America really started to pick up. And you look at those southern states and and the economic impact that the Bible Belt has today. Uh, it's fascinating to see the rise of wealth in those states and what were typically the poor uh, southern states. So by that argument alone, by just the number of slaves, and we would have to say that Brazil would be the... Uh, leader and the richest nation in the world but that's not the case so and we talk about where did slaves come from well slaves came from from africa how did the interior uh, african peoples become rounded up by their own people their own people sold them out so if we're going to bring up slavery we're going to have to address the fact that slaves and their own people enslaved their own people and then sold them to a bunch of people then sold them to more people. And if we are going to discuss slavery uh, as being an issue, why are we not discussing the act of slave markets trading right now in uh, Tripoli? Right now, in Libya. Open-air slave markets to this day are going on and being held, but yet no one's talking about these. So... Slavery can't be the end-all and be-all. Uh, also, if a person was born in another country, his experience of growing up in childhood is in another nation and not in Canada. So when you're coming to Canada, to think about, well, I experienced racism from my last country uh, as a boy growing up, but I don't know what it's like growing up as a boy in Canada. There's some issues and some questions that should be asked when we start looking at property and should everyone own it is it fair that the prices are going up absolutely not but life isn't fair is it a concern for the government to step in no no the government shouldn't step in and that's the problem in canada is that the bigger the government gets the more problems that that Canada is having. Canada is very, very government regulated and now as such uh, has very strict mortgage guidelines. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? 
It's a discussion to be had another day. But the bigger the government gets, the bigger rules and regulations that you get, and it doesn't really help the small people, the people that could use a leg up. Ideally, it would be very nice for everyone to own a home. But if you want to own a home in the city, you're going to have to pay the city prices. You'd have to get the job in order to afford the city. If you want home ownership because you can't afford a million dollar home in Toronto, which is not impressive, move three hours outside of the city and you can buy a lot for a million dollars. It all comes down to supply and demand. And when the government agencies and government newspapers and state-run media start the conversation about land ownership, what does the future hold for this company, this network, and for the people that are listening to it? So I'll leave you with that last thought. Should state-run media talk about land ownership and abolishing land ownership. Thank you again for listening to The Fact Is, and I'm your host, Hollis Grant. You have yourself a great week.